Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Let's talk money. Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. I'm Glenn Craig and I'm your moderator tonight. Here are the brilliant minds that make up the Money Mastermind Show. We have Miranda Marquit from Planting Money Seeds, Peter Anderson from Bible Money Manners, Kyle Prevo from youngandthrifty.ca, and Tom Drake from Canadian Finance Blog. Tonight we have a special guest, Larry Ludwig of the site Investor Junkie. Welcome to the show, Larry. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Now, for those of us, those out there that are watching live, um, I want you to know that there's a question um, app that you can find on the Hangout, and feel free to ask questions via the Hangouts page. Um, if it's relevant and we can fit it in, we'd be happy to feature your question. So please ask away. Now to today's topic. Is wealth inequality systemic? And if it is, what can we do about it? So lately, due to uh, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 20th Century, <laughs> And the Occupy movement from a few days, a few years ago, um, wealth inequality has been brought to the main street a few times here. Um, a recent report shows that the top 1% make almost 20% of wealth in the U.S. And this is the biggest gap since the 20s. Also, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the richest 10% is 16 times as large as the poorest 10%. So, I mean, is this a problem? Is this something that's built into the system? Is there something we can do about that? Um, how does this affect us? Larry, what are your, your basic thoughts on this? Um, well, I mean, I guess first and foremost, it's ironic that the 20%, 80-20 20 rule, the Plato principle, kind of applies to this. Not whether or not that's right or wrong, is regardless, but... Um, I think for the most part, the more important question is more about mobility than inequality. Uh, if you're really not mobile to go up the ladder, so to speak, that's more of a greater concern to me than inequality, as pretty much capitalism does have inequality. So, built into capitalism is some form of inequality, right? Pretty um, much, yeah. Now, is there a problem with capitalism as we have it today? Um, I mean, for me, I have no problem, but I think <laughs> some of the other guests may have. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I I have a problem with laissez-faire, you know, where where you have absolutely no regulation at all because we have seen how that works in the past, and, and we see how it's going now with some of the deregulation. So, well, I think that it's a good idea to, you know, have competition, and I think and, you know, I think that's a good good idea. I do think that, you know, some measure of oversight is important to protect the consumers. Because of, as we've seen, um, especially if you look at things like cable mergers, I think that's a really good, um, a really good example, like cable companies, telecoms, providing internet service. Um, I think that's a really good example. Uh, left to their own devices, they will screw us all to here and gone and... <laughs> You know, there's nothing we can do really much about it because they hold all the cards. And so I think having a little bit of oversight is a good idea just to kind of help, you know, smooth that out and protect us a little bit. Um, but I do agree with Larry in terms of mobility being an issue. Um, we're reaching a point right now in our own, um, in the United States particularly, I don't know about Canada, but I know in the United States we are reaching a point uh, where social mobility is coming to a halt and it's harder than ever and, and that's kind of goes against the United States principles of of, mer uh, of a meritocracy but we are moving to that point where we are running out of social mobility and it's harder than ever to kind of move up the ladder yeah I I agree with uh, both Miranda and Larry that it's I'm not even I'm not even so much worried about income inequality I'm just worried about wealth inequality period uh, and and along with that sort of access to opportunity and I mean the the most equal one of the most equal societies in in the recent world and it's interesting to note that actually Tom Thomas Piketty agrees with us as well uh, he points out that Scandinavia in the 70s and 80s were actually uh, some of the most evenly distributed wealth in in modern modern times and they're the top 10 percent still owned roughly around 40 to 50 percent of the total wealth of the country so 
I don't think we need to be totally equal uh, by any stretch. I do think that, uh, like Miranda pointed out, you know, when one third of the Forbes 500 list is due to inherited wealth, uh, that's not the American dream. That's or the Canadian dream. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, the Roosevelt's and the Vanderbilt's dream. Well, is there anything wrong with inherited wealth? Um, let's just throw that out there. You know, if somebody has a, a rich dad who formed a giant corporation, I mean, is there anything wrong with uh, their kids getting that money? Um, some of them may just inherit it and blow it. Um, some might inherit a company and still run with it and earn even more. I mean, there's no guarantee that they'll keep running the business as the way it's been run. I mean, that's that's pretty much, there's no guarantee. Um, you know, money can be squandered very much, very easily. Most In most cases it is, like third or fourth generation. So, I mean, wealth is not static is ultimately, I think, the biggest concern. Well, and I think, yeah. I think, oh, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, chime in on that as far as the fluid nature and the turnover in that top 1% that uh, gets talked about so much. I mean, there is quite a bit of turnover in that in that top 1%. Um, <clears throat> there was a study from uh, Mark Rank and Thomas Herschel of Cornell, and they looked at 44 years of longitudinal data regarding individuals from age 25 to 60 to see what percentage of American population would experience uh, these different levels of affluence during their lives. And it turns out that 12% of the population will find themselves in that top 1% of income distribution for at least one year. 39% uh, of Americans will spend a year in the top 5%. 56% mm -hmm. uh, will find themselves in the top 10%. And 73% uh, will find uh, themselves in the top 20% uh, for at least one year. Um, but although the 12% of population will experience a year in, in which they find themselves in that top 1%, uh, a mere 0.6% will do so in 10, 10 consecutive years. So it's there is quite a bit of a fluid nature to that top 1%. It, it's no, been no. coined. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, keep in mind that stretches back 44 years. That's pretty much the only time in noted history, uh, or the most equal time, the only time there's actually been a middle class in recorded history, pretty much, uh, as opposed to looking forward and looking at the last 10 to 15 years exclusively. Yeah, and I think that's a good point because when you go back that far to when the middle class first started emerging, uh, the middle class is, is a socioeconomic engineering thing. I mean, it, it happens on purpose. It was something that was engineered. It, it didn't just magically happen. So, so I think what we have here moving forward is, you know, as we've gone forward and looking at the data where they've talked about in the last, you know, in the last ten years. Um, where most of the, the income growth has gone to the top 10%. So they've looked at, you know, most of the income growth in the last 10 years, and that's kind of shifting. And I think that that says a lot about the way, you know, the difference that, that starts seeing break and the difference between the top 10% and the way they earn their, well, earn their money or get their income as opposed to, um, the rest, you know, the rest of us who have earned income as opposed to investment income, you're starting to see a wider gap there, and you're starting to see income gains going to the top more often than they have in the past. Um, you know, well, you know, in that 44-year period. What's the cause of that? I guess is my question. Is it because of government policy, or is it because of bad monetary policy, or bad government policies? Well, see, and that, that's the thing is, you know, one of the things is if you accept, and, you know, and probably not everybody accepts this, but if you accept that the middle class was engineered and, 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 and engineered by the way distribution, wealth distribution and everything, if you look at the rise of the middle class in the middle of the 20th century, um, you're looking at top tax rates of more than 90%. Um, I'm not saying we should have 90% tax rates. What I'm saying is, is, you know, when you start, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying when you start looking at how the tax rates have stepped down, you know, more of that wealth has been flowing to the top. I think another issue, um, once again, is, you know, the growth of the stock market has just exploded in the last 20 to 30 years. And, you know, and even in just the last 15 to 20 years, the growth of the stock market has exploded. And, you know, those in the top income tier make a lot of their money off of investment earnings. Um, a lot of them don't have earned income. It's why, you know, uh, Mitt Romney has a lower, you know, a lower effective tax rate than most of the rest of us because of the way 
that money is taxed differently in the way that their earnings come in. And then the other issue, of course, is you know stagnating wages. So if you are a wage earner, and you if you look at you know the New York Times was reporting on a study um, and show that wages have been stagnating for like two decades. And so if you're a wage earner, you're not making any more. If you rely on wages for your income, you're not making anything. But if you rely on investments for your income, I mean. <laughs> Dow 17,000. So you kind of look at that kind of difference in the way the money's coming up and you kind of start seeing why there's this growing divide. It's funny, Miranda, you said you, you were not saying that we needed 90% tax rates, <laughs> but it's interesting to note that uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who was a Republican president and a pretty successful mm -hmm. war general, my American history is right, was in mm -hmm. favor of like 80% marginal oh, tax yeah. rates. So just interesting. Eisenhower would not be a Republican today, they would kick him out. <laughs> <laughs> so without going into um, specifically taxes or the middle class, because we can certainly talk about that and, and we probably should, um, just I'd like to maybe skip back to capitalism in general. Um, we had mentioned a, a little bit about government intervention and how maybe laissez faire is no good, but is there an inequality in the way that, that capitalism is treated here? So, I mean, obviously we need some government intervention, right? Because otherwise there will be exploitation. That's been proven. It happens. So at what point is it that the government's balancing out those exploitations to protect people um, versus favoring certain wealth classes or corporate classes? You know, Is that a problem? And is that something that affects just about everybody or the middle or lower classes? Someone, not me. Go. <laughs> so basically, are, are corporations, do they now have their own aristocracy? Um, are they being treated in a way that maybe the middle class or the lower class aren't being treated? Well, I'm, I mean, I, I, was, I think lobbies are a big problem, honestly. I, I think that's a big part of the issue of favoritism. I mean, you really are having a corporate structure where they can take advantage to of to, uh, tax rates that say a small business or an individual individual cannot take take advantage of so that's a big concern uh, I'm definitely not for that yeah that's that's a great point Larry and they're more mobile than the small business would be too like I know you, you yourself are a small businessman I imagine you'd have a hard time picking up and going to Ireland uh, uh, yeah. but Apple doesn't uh, or maybe you would it I'm just supposing <laughs> <laughs> not you are bad. wearing green <laughs> <laughs> I can't do the double Irish sandwich, as they call it. Right. <laughs> so let's go back into um, tax inequality, because I think this is part of the, this uh, corporate aristocracy, as well as the wealth and, and such. Um, we mentioned that back in not too long ago, uh, tax rates were in the 90s. Um, during the Reagan administration, his tax cuts for the highest bracket dropped. Um, the nominal rates dropped from 70% to 28% during his administration. Um, that's a huge drop. And um, but in back the same, in... I was going to say, but I mean, the 90% was never paid either. I mean, very few sure. people paid that 90% rate. So the right, that's, that's why... why I, really, yeah, that's, uh, top, yeah, that's why we're talking top marginal nominal the effect, rates. Yeah, the effective rates were more important. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, honestly, the way I usually see the measurements is better to GDP. Taxes to GDP have been pretty much around 18%, 19%. Uh, that to me is more important than the, the the tax rates themselves because it shows how much is total collected. Um, so that to me, I, I think the issue we have bigger the bigger question is how much more government do we want and how much we need to pay for that government. That's I think the bigger question. Well, and I think too going back to uh, your when you were talking about corporate aristocracy, um, one yeah. of the things you know that kind of jumps in there too is CEO pay. Um, <laughs> When you look at CEO pay and, and the difference between, you know, the difference between what a CEO makes and what the, the, the worker makes. And to a certain extent, you're like, well, yes, they're making these big decisions. They're on the hook for it. They should get paid more. But at the same time, what if they make terrible decisions? Their company tanks and, you know, all the workers are having their pensions erased, wiped out, and they're floating away on their, you know, 20 million, you know, $100 million golden parachute. So I think that's one of the issues too is we have this, you know, massive uptake in CEO pay and everybody else has not followed suit. 
Well, I mean, on the other hand, there are CEOs that that get paid a lot and they certainly produce a lot. And um, I'm not personally against that. You know, if you know that under somebody's reign, they were able to pull things in and, and change the corporate structure and make a lot of money for the company, um, there's not anything to me inherently wrong with that. Um, I think the right. issue is when you have CEOs that are making um, just really to the average person, obscene amounts of money. I was just gonna say, mm. what is the word obscene? Like, Do it. <laughs> right. No, but yeah, like I, I sort of agree, Glenn. Like thirty times, thirty times the pay of the average worker. You you could make a valid argument that some of the best CEOs are are worth more than thirty times mm -hmm. uh, the pay of the average worker. But uh, three hundred and fifty times, three hundred and sixty times the pay of the average worker. And I think the problem is is the the la laissez faire market. Uh, doesn't exist when it comes to a lot of CEOs because in many companies, especially in the financial sector, they heavily influence who makes up the board. Uh, the board determines that their their sort of rate for the year. Then they get paid in stock options, which aren't taxed properly anyway. So their net pay, you know, if LeBron James goes out and plays basketball and makes twenty five million, uh, he's given half that to Uncle Sam right off the hop, more or less, roughly, right, uh, between state and. Um, and federal taxation, whereas if uh, you know Mitt Romney or, or any of these other CEO hedge fund type fellas uh, make that money, their net pay is much, much, much higher than that. And don't forget some of these CEOs who, when after they've run, made terrible decisions and run the company into the ground, they're walking away with massive severance packages. Which well, their incentive is actually to do that, because, right? Like right. your incentive, <laughs> if you have stock options, is just to roll the dice as as many times as you can. Because if you, if you lose, you get bought out with a golden parachute, and if you win, you get rewarded with a huge bonus. So the the least attractive option is to actually just run a long-term plan. And it would seem that the correlation to this is that when the CEOs and in turn these corporations are so wealthy, um, as Larry said, they could afford to lobby then and start changing yeah. the rules. And um, that's not something the average person can do. We want to think that we, we all have a voice. You know, we, we keep saying, uh, you know, we're a democracy or we're democratic. Um, but it's really not quite the case all the time, is it? Um, you know, we had the ruling where uh, corporations can give money to political campaigns, right? But at the same time, they're not held liable criminally. You know, you can't put a corporation in jail. You maybe you get away with a CEO, but you can't put the company in jail. Yeah, yeah. Who's so the last CEO that went to jail? Uh, <laughs> Enron and um, WorldCom. Yeah. Uh, um, WorldCom and Enron definitely. It's been a it's been a little while. Maybe they <laughs> stole somebody while. from Arthur Anderson, and I don't know. Yeah. Did but, yeah, yeah, Madoff, I guess, was technically a CEO. Yeah. But, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, one of the, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while. But that's the thing. I think I think uh, Glenn makes a good point. Is it, Lately, in the last, you know, in the last seven to eight years, we have been seeing corporations get granted a lot of the same protections, rights, and abilities as actual people, whether it's um, religious protection, free speech, ability to, contribute to campaigns. Corporations have all these rights that people would have, but as Glenn pointed out, they're never sent to jail for anything. They're not accountable for anything, um, you know, so, <clears throat> and they, but they can use their money to influence the laws and, you know, the government in a, in a way that may not always be, you know, great for the rest of us. So let's jump yeah, over. Maybe... <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yeah, and we talk about uh, you know having having capital capitalism here in, in the United States, and uh, to a certain degree though it's it's kind of almost a, a crony capitalism where where we have uh, these large companies working in, in conjunction with the government to get uh, regulation and so forth that's that's favorable to them or tax law that's favorable to them. So it isn't true a true capitalism in, in some senses. It's it's more of a crony capitalism, and uh, so just thought I'd throw that out there. I, I've been I've been calling it socialized capitalism because uh, <laughs> because the rest of society picks up the pieces, the taxpayers kind of 
you know, act as a bulwark against these capitalistic companies and, you know, they get their profits and everything, but, you know, the rest of society is sort of propping them up. So, I mean, I don't know if that's really accurate, but it's, it's what I like to call it. The, uh, the better term I've heard is capitalism. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so let's go back to the, the middle class. Um, how important is that American dream? That um, you know, any person can rise up and and really have a really have a chance to build wealth in this country. Um, that certainly does seem like, at least you know, from the 20th century, it, it's felt like that's that's been the theme in the United States, right? Um, how important is that to our our future, and is that slipping away now? I think more important to like our future as a country and then as people is to maintain kind of that broad-based middle class that we started engineering in the middle of the 20th century. Um, you know, most regular folks, you know, don't care if, you know, they have, you know, millions upon millions of dollars. Most of them just, you know, want to have a nice, comfortable life, be able to go on vacation on occasion, you know, make sure their kids can go to college. You know, most most people have, you know, fairly modest expectations. I think the thing that starts getting hard is we've almost reached a point where, you know, in the middle class, you're kind of living paycheck to paycheck. So somebody else jump in because I've talked a lot. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) One of the the beauties of capitalism, I think, is that sort of incentive to to strive for more. I know know it doesn't happen all the time. Like when we saw saw the one video clip on... uh, on your post where uh, well, I mean, everybody's no, uh, <laughs> going to do great, but that doesn't happen. But there's no uh, there's no guarantee. Yeah. Yeah, but if if you had no incentive, if everything was totally equal, <laughs> then, then uh, I I don't think there'd be any kind of growth at all. Yeah, to answer to your question, Glenn, I think that's still uh, what most people around the world would say. That's what makes the USA great. Uh, or that's sort of what has supplied the energy that has led to the USA becoming such a, a historical economic standout is that commitment to uh, a meritocracy and and anyone can can start a business and and become wildly successful. I, I think that's still a huge a huge thing. The only question is uh, how do you maintain a fair meritocracy? And and I think that's I think that's actually where Larry and I agree in yeah. a lot of ways. I, I mean, my question is how does does the government rules and regulations that have been constantly adding in the past 10 years helping it or hurting it? I mean, I know Miranda says we have less regulations in the past 10 years, but honestly, if you look at a lot of the regulations we've had, especially now Frank Dodd, Patriot Act, Act um, oh, well, that, Sorbanes-Oxley, <laughs> I mean, all those rules and regulations, we've had more regulations than less. I mean, so that's kind of a myth. I well, mean, what's what well, we and started. Would have just let those banks collapse, right, Larry? We wouldn't have needed these regulations. If those well, shareholders would have been scarred, they would not have invested in banks that were taking those sort of risks ever again. I mean, there's well, a question of how we even got to that point, but that's a whole other right. story. Right. Well, well, so here's the thing, though: is the thing is, is it's it's kind of been a yo-yo because we had there was the regu- there was that huge deregulatory period prior to you know run up run up to the 2000s. There was that huge deregulatory period. A lot of what they've been trying to do in the last, my gosh, it's been, what, six years since the financial crisis, since 2008. Yeah. A lot of what they've tried to do in those last years is kind of recreate what they had prior to the period of deregulation. So they're, so really they're trying to kind of get back to, you know, some of that, some of the stuff that they stripped away, you know, before kind of, you know, the whole, oh, well, we can take down the barrier between investment banking and consumer banking. Yeah. They took away that barrier, and then so then all of a sudden banks could start making all of these risks with consumer banking money. Glass Seagull was yeah, removing Glass Seagull was a mistake. Yeah, so that's what I mean. I mean, I, I'm not saying we have to like regulate the crap out of everything, but I am saying going back to something like Glass Steagall makes sense. A few of these common sense, simple regulations that we had before that were taken away, putting those back in place, I think makes sense. Agreed. I mean, the, the bigger concern, I think, alluding to Kyle's uh, question or issue is, as a small business owner starting up, it's becoming more and more regulation. So as a, biz- a large business, you don't have an issue. You have right. plenty of lawyers and accountants to handle those, those uh, accountability and regulation issues. Where a small business owner, it gets much more difficult to even just bother starting. 
Right. And I think that that's one of the problems that we have, you know, with maintaining, you know, I guess the American dream of, of yeah. you know, of you getting up there. I mean, how many, you know, it goes back to our systemic inequality question is how many barriers are getting put down for the rest of us? You know, I'm going to give a brief shout out to the Canadian government on that one. We've actually done, I, I criticize governments constantly, but we've actually done a pretty good job. I know in, in Tom's home province of Alberta, especially a uh, pretty good job of taking away a lot of that red tape. And uh, maybe few people would think of this because uh, Canada has this sort of reputation as a social communist uh, love fest, but we actually have a corporate tax rate that's like less than half the USA's in most provinces. I mean, Kyle, you you guys are actually rated more free than the United States now. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. <laughs> oh, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Which is social... amazing considering like we also do all these like weird ex social experiments too. You wouldn't think the two would go hand in hand. Well, we do too, so. I mean, we're not totally excluded from that social experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I think people yeah. are pretty uh, pretty afraid of the word socialism, you know, uh, due to its all, its, its uh, communist or communism uh, association. But really, we've been socialist in a lot of ways for, for a long time. Yeah. You know? I mean, we're, we're far from a total laissez-faire Capitalist, capitalistic uh, society. Did, right. did anyone see that, that Goodman uh, political series that, that came out last year? I, I forget what it was called off the top of my head, but there's this great scene where he's in South Carolina. He's a South Carolina representative. And everyone oh, goes, yeah, I hate I that damn that. government intervention. And, uh, <laughs> and then they're, in their next sentence, oh, they're like... Al or is it Alpha House? It's Alpha, Alpha House. House. Alpha, Alpha House. House. And then in the That's next the sentence... Yeah. But they love their oh. Social Security. What about the land grant? I'm, I'm, when are the land grants coming in? Or like, when are we going to get those farming subsidies? This is ridiculous. And so they don't correlate those two things. I just thought that was great writing. Well, it's all the people like out there holding their signs, hands off. You know, don't don't make my Medicaid government run. You know, <laughs> you're going. What? what? <laughs> yeah. We love. Uh, I love my Medicaid. Don't turn it over to the government. <laughs> you're going. What? Yeah. But I think. I think. I think going back to what Larry was saying before, I think the real issue is how mobile are we socially? You know, can we really expect to have those the opportunities that, you know, America was so famous for in the past? And, you know, I don't know if we still have that same level of opportunity still. See, I think um, on the one hand, what Larry was saying about being in a small business, um, mm -hmm. it is, you can start a business very quickly. In right. this day of the internet, there's so many small businesses popping up and there's so many opportunities for people to go off and do their own thing. I mean, you could write a book on your own. You could produce a series on your own. I mean, look at what we're doing here. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we would need a film crew or somebody would have a giant handheld camera. We'd have to be in the same room or something right. along those lines. Um, but on the other hand, um, as another small business owner, if you don't have a good accountant on hand or maybe access to a good lawyer or, or, or things like that, it's a lot to get around. You know, there's all these little taxes that pop up, all these forms that you have to fill out, um, all these things that you need to know. It's still possible, but it's not as um, frictionless as it should be. You know? Well, and I really, yeah, and I think one of the biggest opportunities comes from technology and the ability, you know, to be a solopreneur because, you know, you don't have to worry about that large structure and you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about, all of those things that come with hiring people and having a brick and mortar, you know, business. I mean, honestly, what I do is really easy. And, and I think that those <laughs> kinds of, <laughs> I think that those kinds of opportunities afforded by technology, I think, you know, are really the big hope for, you know, those of us still in the middle class. And, um, you know, I think that that's really kind of where the big hope is. So let's go into something yeah, else here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, <people. laughs> you cut you out there. We, we we always do this like every episode. You know, there's like a, a like a half a second pause, and then I jump in, and Peter's gonna say something, and we just <laughs> don't wait too long. Yeah. That. But uh, no, please, Peter, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I think that opportunity is still there. Like some of you guys are saying that you know it can be a little bit more difficult with all the red tape and uh, being a small business person these days isn't as easy as it could be. Um, and I think one thing, we tend to focus a lot on, on income inequality between people at the top, uh, the top 1% and people, the rest of the people, basically. But I think uh, one place that we may want to focus more on is uh, inequality, uh, things that we can actually help as middle class, and that's finding an education, maybe. And uh, uh, MIT economist David 
Autor uh, had a study from 1980 to 2012, inflation-adjusted full-time earnings of college-educated males increased anywhere from 20% to 56%, depending on whether they also acquired a graduate degree. Conversely, real earnings of high school graduates fell 11%, and earnings of high school dropouts fell 22%. So right there, that's a, that's a pretty big inequality if you're getting an education versus if you're not, and that's something that a lot of people can can still help. Yeah, the cost of college is, is skyrocketing, but uh, there are still good, way, good ways to find a good education. And uh, that is one way you can still improve your lot and uh, improve your income. So, And I think we even talked about in a prior episode where just having a college education is a great hedge a- against unemployment. So even if you can't find a job, you're better off having that education than not. There's a huge gap right there. But in education itself, do we see a lot of inequality? So are there opportunities more for the wealthy in education in general than for people who are in the middle and lower class? So are they systemically um, better off? Because certainly education, coming from New York um, and now living out on Long Island, which is still part of New York, but outside of New York City, um, there's a big difference in the schools there. And even from town to town, you can see big differences in the schools. So when you're getting a better education just in elementary school, middle school, high school, that's going to set you up for a better education in college. And right there, you know, if having a college degree is something that helps you wealth-wise, then you've already got a leg up. As long as it's a useful major. I mean, that's ultimately, I mean, to me, the the STEM majors is the most important. Um, Not to say other majors should be ignored, but I think those are the ones that have the greatest economic success in. Well, well, I think it goes back to... We should do a show about that. I know, right? (laughs) No, I think it goes back to what we were talking about before when you say marketable skills. You know, what what kind of skills are you developing, um, even if you don't get a college, like a four-year degree or whatever. I think it goes back to marketable skills. Yeah, I think one other thing while we're discussing sort of what what the average person can do, um, like as as much as everyone likes to rail and and get in touch with their inner Occupy, uh, really if, if you want to look at it, if you know that it's a little bit of a rig game, that there's lobbyists that are uh, slanting things in favor of shareholders of major corporations, um, you know what? Become a shareholder in a major corporation uh, in the meantime until things go the way you want them to. Uh, I think like collecting dividends and capital gains, um, it's, it's by far the most tax efficient way. Historically, the gains are much better than real estate, so it's way better than making yourself house poor and not having any investments. So if you can sort of work your way into that circle to any degree possible, uh, that's a good thing for you. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. that. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle, I was going to say, I've literally done that. I've had friends uh, complain about how, how certain companies are ripping them off and they're charging too much. And it's, it's so I invest in those companies and uh, yeah. collect the dividends. <laughs> Especially in Canada. Our monopoly on banks and uh, telemarketers, like it's or uh, telecommunications rather, the profit margins are huge, and they always will be. So <laughs> that's regulations, there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was just gonna say a lot of people don't realize maybe that um, compared to maybe just 10, 15, 20 years ago, investing is so much easier than it's been. You know, you could buy a fraction of one share of one company, um, whereas in the past you needed to have a round lot of shares, and you need you really need a lot of capital and and know a broker to get into it, whereas now, you know, 50 bucks and you're opening up an account. Um, so building those stocks and, and assets like that is, is relatively easy, and I think any, that's something anybody can get into if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. What else can we do? Um, since we know about this inequality, and it's probably not going to change too much, you know, things will, will teeter here and there, um, but what can we do to, to help protect ourselves or at least maybe get in on the game and, and profit off of it. Well, I think investing is one good thing. I'm a big proponent of, of investing because you, just about anybody can do it now. Um, 25 bucks in a, you know, in an index fund, right? Uh, get you started. And, but I think building some sort of income diversity is important. Um, because today you cannot rely on a job to stay your job forever. The days of the 30-year career and the pension at the end are gone. I mean, they just are. And I think income diversity is very important. You know, start a side business, you know, whatever. Um, But I think having different sources is very important. 
you guys had uh, right out of my mentioned mouth. education already, but uh, I'm not a big fan of when it comes to income diversity of, about uh, education being the answer because I've seen a lot of people get like like one or two percent raises every year, and that doesn't really help you get ahead like a CEO would. Uh, so I agree with Miranda that that's something on the side, like a business, is a great way. Like. Like many of you, I know I start my business for about fifteen dollars, so it's <laughs> there's not much holding anyone back. See, I think when we talk about education, it doesn't necessarily have to be just a degree either. Like you don't have to have a four-year degree, you don't have to have a master's degree or a PhD. Although those things are great if you can use them, um, but education could also be just something where if you're working at a job anywhere, if you're in a nine-to-five somewhere, you know, typing up TPS reports all day. Education is, is to me also learning about the job. You know, what does your boss do? What does your company do? Uh, the days of of being a, a corporate robot are are slipping away. You know, no longer can you just be some machine that produces the cog, whatever that cog is, because those jobs are either disappearing through technology or they're being outsourced to somebody else who will do it for way cheaper. So you have to educate yourself constantly and learn more. You know, it could be being a whiz with Excel. It could be being able to write a, a better email. But you need to keep constantly growing to to get ahead because those are the people who are going to be the managers, the, the supervisors, and hopefully eventually uh, people who have a real say in a company and building wealth. I'm going to say, I mean, constantly adding value. I mean, be it if you work for someone else or your own business, you always need to add value. Otherwise, you don't have a business or you usually get unemployed. Uh, to me, that's important. So, uh, you know, it's constantly never-ending improvement. Yeah. I mean, where I used to work in the 9 to 5, it was if a cut was needed for some reason, it was those people that really, you know, who what's the lowest that we can cut? Those people who who wasn't bringing the who aren't bringing the most skill to the group and they were gone, so it was the people who were like, no, we can't we can't get rid of Bob. We need him. He's good. He's like two or three people, but everybody else, you know, they're gone. Let me let me ask you this question then, because this is sort of related to that. Is then does the minimum wage help or hurt that by increasing it? Because if if you have to set a floor of what people will accept as far as the salary then you probably want more experienced individuals. So does that help or hurt the minimum wage? Does the minimum wage help unemployment and help people at the lower end of the spectrum? I say no. It will help people at the lower end of the spectrum because you're talking about people who are doing um, part-time jobs or just very low-paying full-time jobs. I mean, I think even waiters and waitresses, the, their income has literally stayed the same for I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they really have just been living off of tips and you know that hasn't really uh, changed in quite some time. So I think changing that and raising the minimum wage can help a lot of people get by. Yeah, no, I'm 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 just bringing up the question because of, I know it's a whole other topic, but so I mean we've talked a lot about um, education and taxes and, and corporations and whatnot, and uh, I think we've come to the conclusion that there are some real inequalities. Um, in the system. So maybe just go around and let's just talk about maybe a final word on what we can do and, and just about the situation in general. Um, let's start with Kyle. Well, the good news for uh, us gentlemen is that marrying rich is no longer the exclusive domain of women as uh, women become more and more CEOs. Uh, being a gold digger can now go both ways. So in, in all seriousness, um, you know, obviously picking a partner, you don't do it based on their net worth, hopefully, uh, but shared values about uh, about money and, and just how, how it works and how it operates are uh, not a bad thing from what I've seen. And Miranda, your final word. Oh, my. <laughs> well, I think, I think it does. It goes back to uh, diversity of skill um, and diversity of income sources. And I definitely think... Um, I think also goes back to, you know, what you were saying before. I mean, you have to get back into being an owner, um, you know, invest a little bit, uh, have, have a side business. Uh, you've got to start thinking in those kinds of terms. And so even if you aren't, you know, a billionaire or whatever at the end, you know, these are the things that, you know, the middle class needs to do just to even maintain a middle class lifestyle. 
at this point. And Peter, what are your final thoughts? All right. Well, my final thoughts are just this: to stop worrying about the one percent and, and what they're doing, and and worry about what you can do, things that you can affect. You may not be part of the one percent uh, for your income, but you can do things to improve your lot. You can get an education and, and get those marketable skills, like we talked about, even if it's just a, a two-year degree or, or finding some other skills through an apprenticeship or something. Uh, and then investing early and often. Uh, be entrepreneurial. Find ways that you can diversify your income add income sources, and uh, invest. Okay. And, Tom, your final thoughts? Well, everyone likes complaining about the system, no matter what side you're on. Um, <laughs> but instead of complaining about it, use it to your advantage. Uh, like we've talked about, uh, invest in dividend-paying stocks because you get better tax treatment. Uh, if, you, if you don't like the fact that you need an a education to get a better job, get an education. <laughs> you, can, you can use all these things to your advantage. Obviously, we need some tax reform uh, uh, on certain things, but there's a lot of things we complain about that we could actually use to our advantage. And I'd like to close with just the, there's a, an idea of this word Kaizen, where mm -hmm. the idea is you're always constantly making small improvements. And I, I think that's a, a concept that a lot of people could really do well with, no matter what you're doing. You just always have to be improving because technology is just moving too fast for any of us to be stagnant at any job. Whatever you're doing, you have to be improving. Um, that and the fact of it's not what you earn, but it's what you keep. So whatever bracket you're in, you need to optimize your taxes as best you can. Um, you know, If you can speak to a, a tax and accountant and, and find out from them what best things you can do, then do it. So, All right, guys. This has been a, a really great, fun show. And uh, thank you all for watching us. Larry, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Please tell our audience a little bit about Investor Junkie, if they don't already know. Well, it's, a, it's an investment website, obviously, based on the name. Um, it's The goal, ultimately, for the site is to be, assuming you have your ducks in a row and you're already to the point where, okay, you, you, you've listened to someone like Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman, and you do, what do you do now? And ultimately, it's about um, you know taking, like you said before, about becoming your own business owner, but also doing investing and do it really, you know, intelligently. Do it via indexing and also do it via uh, owning real estate and just overall managing your business. Thanks a lot, Larry, and thank you thank again. You. Thanks for joining us at the Money Mastermind Show. Uh, for more information, go to moneymastermindshow.com. There you can find links to all of our social media um, accounts, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google+. Plus as well as um, please make sure that you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. We would love to have you there. You subscribe and you will get every episode just sent to you automatically. Um, until next week, guys, be good with your money. Good night. Thanks for joining us on the Money Mastermind Show. Get more information at moneymastermindshow.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on Google+.